All right, guys. Um, so I think we we're going to start now. So welcome, Cloud Foundry. Um, my name is Enrique Encalada, and I'm here today with Matias Dister uh, to speak a little bit about open source tools for everyone. So when I speak about open source tools, uh, I get really excited. It's kind of a similar feeling, I guess, like when my mom speaks about religion. And um, I think that the concept of open source hit me back in the days when uh, we were working in one of the IBM Cloud uh, offerings at that time of Cloud Foundry. And we wanted to, we, we had this proposal. Basically, we wanted to leverage the config management setup of, uh, we're speaking around 60 to 70 Cloud Foundry environments that we managed at that time. And we basically uh, wanted to simplify the config management. Basically, we want to make it easier and generic. So we came up with a solution, and that solution was fully based on an open source tool. At that time, uh, this is actually a, a Golang binary tool. Uh, the name is Spruce, and that is uh, developed at the time uh, by Stark and Wayne. So the, the point was like, uh, as with many tools in the market, it's really hard to find a, all, uh, a, a, a tool that fits all sizes, right? And this was the case with the Spruce tool. Um, so basically, for us, in order to, to have the proposal and to achieve the goal we want, uh, we needed to open pull requests to this uh, piece of software. Uh, eventually, that's what we did. Uh, we had features on top of the upstream code. Uh, the, the, the maintainers uh, merged the, the, the code, and everyone was happy. But the crucial thing at that, at that time is that I realized that open source empowered people to do great things. So from the perspective of the user, we were basically able to uh, keep the same essence of the tool, but we added new features on top. And from the perspective of the owners, they were getting like feedback from us, and they were getting like uh, not new contributions on, on top of the tool. So this was day one for us, uh, at least for me. And as after that day, I, I was always thinking on open source uh, software. So every time I was uh, involved in new projects, I was always keeping in my mind, maybe it's time to use a, a tool that is already there existing. Maybe I could contribute to them. Or maybe it's time to generate our own uh, set of tools uh, to automate things. So this was day one. And we're here to tell you what happened after that day. And this is basically our story with open source tool, tools. So the agenda is quite simple. We want to speak about the why, we want to speak about the how, and we want to speak about the what. So we want to tell you why did we need some tools at the first place. Uh, we want to share with you how did we write the tools. And finally, we want to tell you what did we end up with. So what, what we came up with, um, like what are the tools we use now. <clears throat> so let's speak about the why. All right. So. Uh, both Matthias and myself, we are developers for CIFI. <coughs> CIFI stands for Cloud Foundry Enterprise Environment, and it basically allows uh, users uh, or customers to, to have a containerized Cloud Foundry. Basically, you run Cloud Foundry on top of Kubernetes. Um, so when you speak about uh, offerings like this, uh, SUSE have CAP, uh, we have CIFI. When you speak about offerings like this, uh, you have like a mix of two words. You have from one side Cloud Foundry and from the other side Kubernetes. So for example, the way you are used to debug Cloud Foundry is not longer the same as you will, uh, as you will be used to do with Bosch. Uh, the second thing is like Kubernetes is also like it has like a very high learning curve and it's not uh, very easy to grasp all the concepts uh, at the very first glance. So you need a little bit of experience with Cube. Then on top of that, you add Cloud Foundry and a lot of uh, binaries that you need, you need to use, um, Helm, kubectl, and a lot of bash scripts. So without uh, going into too much detail about this, um, if you take a look on the type of workload that we have every day, we usually do like four things. Uh, like I call it uh, blocks. We build things. Uh, we'll, uh, we also deploy, then we test, and usually at the end we debug, of course, things and eat and repeat, right? So let's take a look on each of these blocks, and um, I'm just trying to show you that I just want to um, yeah, show you where do we have like needs on building new tools. So for example, the build. The build is everything around config management, and config management boils down to JOML files. So it was always about JOMLs, JOMLs, and more JOMLs. And the thing with YOMLs is like defining a YOML is quite simple. The syntax is like a straightforward. But when you want to do YOML comparisons, uh, is where you would like to have like a nice compact uh, way of uh, visualizing things. So this was the first um, thing where we realized, hey, we need a tool to manage YOML files. So the second thing will be about deploy. So when you have like two words like Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes, 
uh, you don't longer deploy uh, Cloud Foundry on the way you used to do that with Bosch. So you have, for example, Helm. So Helm is like a Helm is basically a package manager, and that's all he do for you. Like he will never tell you what could go wrong with the deployment or what could go wrong with what you want to upgrade. So then you have kubectl if you would like to modify resources uh, on the on the fly. So eventually, like all of this mix of things uh, led to frustration. We actually wanted like some sort of uh, single binary that allows to do pre-processing, then Helm, then post-processing, everything like compact in a single tool, and we didn't have that. So when we speak about the next block, like test, test was also a similar case. Like we wanted really to stop pushing Dora. We wanted uh, to avoid like downloading assets uh, for testing uh, different runtimes. And what we wanted was like a single binary that could uh, run all the runtimes with a single command. We didn't have that. Uh, we wanted to test also, um, we wanted to see what was going on in our clusters when we trigger upgrades or maintenance. Uh, we didn't find the right tool for that. We wanted also to define like thresholds uh, during maintenance. Like how many HTTP 500 calls are you going to allow during an upgrade, things like this. So this eventually led to frustration. And um, yeah, so frustration, frustration, and we realized that it was time to come up with new things. So the last block is debugging. So when you mix two words like Cloud Foundry and Cube, you eventually will come up with solutions for your problems. But if you take a look on what you're doing, you will start like mixing a lot of different binaries, and it's going to be like a small monster that you will be building that will not scale, and not, it will be not very maintainable in the long term. So we have like tools like kubectl, less, bi, money, docker, watch, etc. At the end, this end up with a lot of cursing. Okay, that um, brings us to the how. Um, how did we do that? So we decided we want our tools. And we started with one very simple idea, eating your own dog food. So we decided, okay, we will write the tools we need um, alongside our work, one, <clears throat> one feature at a time. So whenever we realized we need something new, we wrote it into the tool, as you would always do with your helper scripts and so on. And we wanted to bring everything together under one nice organization and new name. So since the Kubernetes community seems to love this nautical terms a lot, like Helm and Tiller and so on, so we decided we want to stick with that style too. So, and to be honest, I'm a land lover, so I have no idea about the sea and whatever. So I did what every sane person would do. I opened Wikipedia and read through the glossary of nautical terms. There are actually a lot of nautical terms. Um, I read them one by one and actually I fell asleep halfway through C. So we decided to keep it simple. Uh, we just called it Homeport since it is the home of our projects. And we gave up the idea of giving all our tools somehow nautical names. Only one actually ended up having that, such a name. So what we're currently having is uh, four major tools plus uh, a lot of support tools we need and support projects and libraries we had to write from scratch. Um, and we decided to keep it simple. So for all the tools we decided we use Golang as the programming language mainly for three reasons. Um, portability, uh, cross-platform uh, support, and everybody else seems to use Go anyway, so we decided to use Go. Um, other than that, we picked the usual suspects, so GitHub to uh, host your open source projects uh, with its awesome Travis CI integration, and we later um, adopted Dependabot for the Go module update automation. Um, so to be fair, all of those tools would also be available within IBM, so we have GitHub Enterprise and so on, but uh, this time we decided, okay, let's make it really solid since we thought these tools could also be helpful for others that use uh, Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry in combination. So we said, okay, um, not let's write the tools we need for ourselves, but write it in a way that everybody can also um, participate. So how did we do that? Um, mainly you need three things, obviously, uh, watchful eye, so whenever you find something useful and said, okay, that could be automated. We made ourselves a mental note or even better, sometimes a GitHub issue and said, okay, we will implement that later. Uh, obviously you need time um, to code that. Not always in your project work, you have time to write, write a nice shiny tool um, at, the si at the site. So we also heavily relied on students. So we had three very good students that uh, helped us uh, code alongside. And um, here over time, 
basically the project matured into really useful helpers we use in our daily work and we uh, think everybody is, uh, others could also benefit from from using them so that brings us to the what so we would like to quickly show you some of the tools and, and how they look like okay yeah so let's speak about the the first tool this one is called uh, diff um, basically, this is all about JOMLs, so it's all about uh, visualizing what's going on in your JOMLs whenever you do modifications and so on. Uh, Diff was actually originally written in Ruby, and then we ported to Golang, because Golang is the language of the cloud. Uh, so let's take a little bit of, uh, yeah, let's, I will showcase some demos. All right, so here I have two JOML files. I have the Philly Summit JOML. And I have the hack summit jumble, right? So if we could first take a look on what's going on on Philly, which is like the conference that took place this year in North America, we will see a very short jumble file. So you will have like a home port with a nested conference key. There is a name, which is CF Summit, a user home port, a year continent, a list of open source tools, uh, some phrases in English language, and of course, a certificate. So if we take now a look on the next JOML file, which is the hack, hack, sorry, um, you have very similar uh, JOML definition, but there are some small changes. So now, um, like, I don't think you already uh, kind of spot the, the, the deltas we are having there, but if we will use the diff tool to show the uh, differences between these two JOMLs, you will do something like diff between uh, origin file, which in this case will be Philly Summit and the file you want to compare with, which will be the hack summit. All right, so this is how the, the diff tool looks uh, when you run a specific command. In this case, we use the between feature. And here we have the, f the first thing. His, uh, diff is telling us that we have six difference uh, between these two JML files. So the first one, and this one is uh, really hard to spot just by just taking a look, is that for the user on their conference, there is actually a character change. And you could see that we modified home port from the O from a lowercase to an uppercase. So this is really helpful when you deal with uh, large JOMLs because you really want to immediately realize about specific changes. Uh, the second one that it, it could also happen that by accident you modify a, 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 a variable type. And in this case, we did that and we modified that from a string to an integer. So the diff, of course, is going to tell you that. Uh, next thing is just like a, a, a Continent list, um, it, there is only one item in index zero. And of course, we override the item zero uh, from North America to Europe. Uh, then we have a list of open source tools. And this one is also really interesting because Diff can tell you if the order, cha if the order change in your list. So here, for example, we uh, move Gonot into a different uh, index. Uh, another example of uh, list uh, here we have the phrases, uh, some phrases that you will say in the uh, host uh, country language. And basically we overwrite all of that list into uh, Dutch. And last but not least, uh, we have also um, a nice way to decode certificates. Basically we can give you insights on certificates and in this specific case, uh, uh, Diff is telling us that there were actually changes in the certificate for the conference and we basically change uh, the locality and the state. Um, one more thing will be about uh, how diff could help you to pretty print JML files. So if I will do something like cut Philly, and then I will, um, and then I will, well, uh, where is the pipe? Yeah, if I will pipe a standard input to um, diff, you could do something like this. And diff is basically going to show you a more easy JOML to understand. You could see also that there is like indentation, indentation lines and so on. So this is all about diff. Uh, let's take a look on the next tools. Okay, thanks. Um, which brings us to uh, the next one. Um, we quickly want to talk about, it's called Gonad, and Gonad is really that simple it's all about pushing apps um, so what I have on the left side is um, 
Kubernetes cluster. It runs uh, Cloud Foundry Enterprise Environment and actually with Irene. And the Irene bit is just to show the app a little bit more. So what we have, and so keep in mind what we're doing. So we built custom Cloud Foundry. So we change parts and copy and change things there because of reasons. And so we always leave the, the official path of the Cloud Foundry tested builds. So uh, first thing we have to do once the new build is actually ready is we do a simple push test and see um, how it turns out. And then we can decide how to continue. And I would just push a simple sample app in Go. So the idea is we need just a simple tool that we can use in a, in a pipeline or on your local machine. Just push and sample app, the simplest app you can think of, different languages, Go, Python, PHP, whatever, to test all the build packs we have, Swift, for instance. Um, but as much as I like the CF push experience, what I don't like is like this massive output you get, uh, especially if you only want to know did it work or not. So what you did is we uh, wrote Gonad. Gonad actually has a lot of sample apps and they are bundled within the binary. Think of it, your old extractable zip files from the past. So Gonad will unpack into the temporary directory the uh, sample app, will push it. It will try to make the output as small as possible. Um, and most importantly, it will actually delete the app once you pushed it and it was verified that you can reach it because what I hate is that I have to manually delete all my artifacts. So most of the tools were actually created because we're lazy. So what you, you can see on the left side down there, there's a new pot coming up showing in, in yellow that, okay, this is actually the Arini based um, application. So once it's up and running and we can reach it, Gonad will immediately delete the app. You can configure the behavior, but the default behavior is that we delete the app. And after one and a half minutes, we should see a result. Um, and again, the idea was, think of it running it in concourse pipeline. So we need really compact output where I can quickly see yes or no. And this is the output saying, okay, obviously it worked. And you can also do something what I call it, like a shotgun test. You can actually say, please go not push all build packs and give me an output. So if PHP, whatever. Um, so that would be Gonad, that simple. Um, which brings us to the last tool we would like to show you, which is called Havener. It's our multi-purpose um, tool for Cloud Foundry on Kubernetes workloads, mainly developed because, you know, you have two worlds now. Um, you have to go into some pods and check things that are Cloud Foundry related and so on. And you always have to repeat the same tasks again. This is an amazing tool. <laughs> so actually, on the left side, you already see a little bit of Havener. So what we have is uh, when you run Cloud Foundry on Kubernetes, you have different namespaces like UA namespace, CF namespace, Irene namespace. And we often have to watch those namespaces at the same time. So I would have to type a lot of times watch kubectl whatever. Like I said before, I'm lazy. So we wrote like a wrapper around that that actually combines the output of different namespaces in a somehow meaningful way. And since we all love colors, we colored it because if you have like the multi-container pods, it's easy to miss, like, is it three or three containers running or two or three containers, especially if it's a long list. So we decided just make it yellow if it's not three or three, so that can e you can easily spot uh, where you have to debug something. Okay. Um, other use cases uh, we had with um, Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes is, again, think it's a freshly built, non-standard Cloud Foundry. Something's not working, so I have to debug things. And what you would end up doing is go into the pod, go to var v capsys log. We all love that directory. Look through the logs and so on. Okay, it's not there. I go somewhere else. So we decided it would be nice to have a way that actually why can I have all the logs of all pods of all containers on my local machine so that I can use my favorite editor to search through that my favorite ever editor. So we wrote a, tool, um, a feature called logs. As you can see on the left side, this usually runs quite some time depending on the internet connection here. It's actually taking quite some time, but we actually don't have to wait until it's ready because we can already see the results. Um, so what it does, it 
dumps all the log files of all the ports and containers in the file system, in your local file system, and it tr follows the directory structure of the uh, specific uh, container. So you can like easily dive into, okay, API group, Wavi, Capsys, log, show me the cloud controller log, for instance. And we use that quite a lot like to trace like uh, you know, sometimes you have like part of a request ID or something like that, so you can easily search that in all parts and container logs at the same time. This um, one note of device, this is due to the fact that we use the awesome SUSE Cloud Foundry and the current version of SUSE Cloud Foundry actually works like that the pod and containers act a little bit like the VMs you know from the Bosch world and therefore you have all the logs basically similar to uh, what you know in, in the Bosch world and therefore there's the need to have a easy way to download all this stuff. So we can keep this one running. Um, what else did we need? So there was this one time where there was a pod that actually went crazy and used a lot of CPU, so we have to hunt them down. Okay, you start with your kubectl and say, okay, give me some stats about the usage. kubectl is actually pretty silent about that. Okay, what about the um, pods, even less information, obviously. So um, we wrote basically a wrapper around that saying, why can't we have something like htop or top for kubectl and our Cloud Foundry, especially with Cloud Foundry in mind. So what we have here is like getting the same metrics from kube, from the kube metric service, but aggregated in a way that is useful for us, for instance, by summing up all the information about the CF namespace, for instance. And this was basically a way to find out um, where exactly could we optimize in terms of do we have some containers that are not behaving well. And this is basically how we went on from there. Whenever there was something we found cumbersome, so we decided to, okay, let's write a feature. Um, one of the other things that I don't like because it's a lot of typing, so I would like to go into the UA. So first, uh-huh. There's a UA namespace. So I have to type something like this. Um, I want to connect to it, so standard in, TTY, the usual suspects. Actually, this is the pod name. I have to remember the container name is like this, and I obviously want a shell. And there you have the shell, similar to what boss SSH uh, would do for you. Okay, I think I said before the lazy part, so, um, we decided, okay. We will explain why lazy is important. Okay. Um, can it be easier? So we decided, okay, let's write a wrapper. Um, it's called pod exec. And since I'm lazy, there's also an alias for just PE. And the idea is always, if you don't really know what to do, just don't type anything. Havener will print out an error um, helping you. So in this case, it actually prints out possible target locations. For instance, here you see, okay, there's UA. So we say, let's give me a shell in this one. And we use a slightly compact notation saying, okay, namespace slash pod slash container, just to avoid typing, obviously. And that basically gives you the same result. And from there on, it kind of was its own thing. And the next feature came because there was the next uh, requirement for a feature. Um, for instance, what we really like about Bosch, for instance, is that you have the possibility to run a command in multiple instance groups at the same time, multiple VMs. Um, what I don't like is how the output looks like. It's, for me, it's too much. I prefer a compact output. So what we decided, okay, there must be a way to do that as well. So why not write it? Um, so what we have is, we call it distributed shell mode. Basically what happens is um, the command is executed on all the pods, containers at the same time and you get the output. Um, but what we want you to have is that you don't have to specify do you need standard in TTY. Even it will always guess by the use case what to use and what not to use. You can always override it, of course, but by default it will figure it out what you want to do. And yeah, the, the output was also always thought in a way that make it as compact as possible. So we use, again, color coding to make sure that you see from which part this uh, line originates from. 
And where we actually use that is to do something like that. So we tail a file on multiple containers at the same time. This is sometimes useful to track down requests where you don't really know where it maybe come from and you have to watch multiple containers at the same time to figure out where it is. Um, so that can be really useful to also track live logs in, in like a fresh uh, system. And last but not least, and then we'll shut up, is sometimes you even have to go deeper and you actually have to go on the worker node. So cube itself doesn't really support like a convenient way to do that. There's a way with kubectl that you can kind of hijack uh, a root shell on, on your node, but it's kind of a lengthy command and I don't want to repeat myself. So we wrote a wrapper for that. It's called um, node exec and you can also say just ne and just pick a node and say, okay, I want a shell there. And after some time and some black magic, you get um, a root shell on the worker node. Again, that also supports distributed shell mode. So you can actually really heavy shoot yourself in the foot by like doing really destructive operations on the worker node if you want to do so. Actually, this is really sometimes useful. So we had issues where like we saw that the um, container registry that stores local images um, like got full and there's no official way to get there other than just to bounce the, the node. So that's kind of an like backdoor for you to, um, it's, not official, it's not a backdoor, but it's tricky to get in there with the official ways just to do some uh, black magic on the node itself. There are other features, uh, go check on them, um, like password strings, um, checks, secret checks and so on. Uh, but we just leave it in there in the interest of time. Um, some final thoughts, um, was it worth it? Yes, open source development is great, even for like uh, small tools. Um, what we really like to have is uh, contribution and, and this is really great that you get ideas from outside of your company for another feature. Um, distribution is great with the, the current setup, like with GitHub and GitHub releases that you can store binaries there, it's, it's, it's awesome um, and it's technically all kind of for free. Um, and you can generate value, just not just for you, but also for everybody else that um, can use such a tool. Um, goes without saying, Go was actually a good choice to do such a thing. Um, it is a great programming language for CLIs. Uh, we had a little bit of trouble with the Go modules at some point, especially if you have like really a lot of dependencies, but overall it, it's a great experience. And what really helped us is that we actually copied the same uh, project setup for all the projects. So the scripts, everything, we use same naming styles, same directories and so on. And that really made it easy to switch between projects because we always know uh, where everything is. And last but not least, these services are great. I mean, we really have some awesome services available on the internet like Travis that we actually use for our automation of building new releases and uploading them to GitHub automatically without us doing anything. Um, Homebrew is great for the, the Mac users to have like this distribution vehicle. And I really love Dependabot. Um, it really helps us with the Go modules. Um, and that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, and one more thing about the laziness. Like actually laziness is sometimes good because you don't want to repeat things. So you make sure that what you code is done in the right way. So you automate as much as possible. Anyway, uh, just take a photo or make notes. This is our, these are the links about uh, the main tools we have in under Homebird org. Uh, if you would like to uh, get in contact with us, this is our Twitter handles. And of course, we have a Slack channel in the Cloud Foundry org called Homebird. Um, yeah, I think that was all. This is our story. I hope you enjoy. And now we're open for questions. <laughs>